In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and unto the ages of all ages, Amen. Welcome to another episode of One Accord. We're trying to look at the amazing work of the Holy Spirit in the early church, uh, the apostolic church, as presented to us in the book of Acts, chapter 1 and 2. And in looking at the model of the apostolic church, we would love to implement these teachings and also uh, these lessons in our modern church to ensure that the church in the 21st century is as effective as it was in the first century by the grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit. Today we're going to uh, continue looking at um, the book of Acts chapter 2 and uh, we were reading in uh, verse 42 and it says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread. So we'd like to focus today on the breaking of bread. One of the main secrets to the effectiveness and strength and power of the apostolic era is that the church was a sacramental church and it was specifically a Eucharistic church. The word Eucharist just means uh, thanksgiving, to give thanks to God, but it's the name given to the celebration of the divine liturgy uh, which concludes in the breaking of bread or concludes in the partaking of the Holy Communion. Our Lord Jesus mentioned in the Gospel of John chapter 6 and starting from verse 53, the following beautiful words. Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. But some of the disciples and his early followers doubted in him. And he said, how can this man give us his own flesh to eat and his own blood to drink? Well, make no mistake about it, we're not cannibalists. We are eating the true flesh and the true blood of Jesus Christ concealed in the bread and in the wine. But we believe that this is truly the real flesh and real blood of Jesus Christ. So when they stumbled, everyone asked, how could that be? So the Lord was so strict with them. And he told them that unless you believe in this sacrament of the Eucharist, you have no part with me. Our Lord Jesus spoke to his disciples and he told them, if you don't believe in this sacrament, you will follow me no longer. And many of them from that day left him and did not become his disciples. The Lord said, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It's the Spirit who gives life and continues by saying that from that day on, many of the people walked away from him and did not become his disciples. The Lord didn't call them back because this is one of the essentials of our Christian faith. It is the belief and the doctrine of partaking of the Holy Eucharist, the real body and the real blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which brings us in fellowship with him, which gives us eternal life and uh, forgiveness of our sins. In the early church, there were many people who starting to take this sacrament lightly and did not prepare themselves well for partaking of the Holy Eucharist. This uh, instance is mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we can see that the church life, they were always coming together to have fellowship, to eat together and to break the bread and to, par and to partake of the Holy Eucharist. So the scripture which says, would say that the Lord instituted the sacrament and then he said, therefore whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. He's guilty of the body and blood. It means that it's not a symbol and it's not a memory. He is guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself. In that sense, 
the scripture tells us that we have to prepare ourselves. Let me first point out that no one can make him or herself worthy through any acts or works because worthiness or the ability to stand before God only comes through His grace, through His grace, not through our works in any way as mentioned in the rest of the epistles and scriptures, that our righteousness comes only from God. Let me point out that our true righteousness does not come from any acts or works that we do, because righteousness is given to us only through the grace of God. It is granted to us through the blood of Jesus Christ and there is nothing that we as human beings can do in order to attain this righteousness or to be worthy to partake of this great grace and blessing from God. Nevertheless, we have to prepare ourselves, the small things that are in our heart. Number one, we have to be true believers in this sacraments and in this mystery and not have any doubt whatsoever that we are partaking the real flesh and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that is granted to us as a free gift. Secondly, I have to be in fellowship with God and I have to have a real relationship with Him in prayer and in supplications. This is really important for my own sake. Thirdly, I want to say that it's important to ha live a life of repentance and of confession because all of these mystery sacraments are connected with one another. I have to have a confession, Father. I have to really think about my own weaknesses and pray to God to help me to overcome them and not to be led by my own will into any kind of temptation, but live a holy life in the sight of the Lord. Nevertheless, I want to affirm that God loves us, even if we are living in sin, even if we are very far from Him, He still is seeking us to return back to Him and to tell us, come unto me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Those who are well have no need for the physician, but those who are sick, those who are ill. That's the message of the scriptures. So he doesn't want us to be pushed away from this sacrament. There are many people who keep away from partaking of the Holy Communion for years and years and years. Maybe they are upset with a family member. Maybe they feel that they are unworthy. But worthiness, righteousness comes only through the grace of God. Not by, not by our own might or power, says the Lord. The Lord wants us just to present ourselves, our hearts to Him, and to confess to Him that our righteousness only comes from you, Lord. My dear friends, let us not deprive ourselves from this great mystery, the greatest gift that the Lord has left the church, which is His own flesh and His own blood. Let us not have any doubts in our hearts. This was the practice of the early church and the reason for its strength. And if we deviate in any way from this strength, the church is going to become weak. The individuals will become weak. Yes, we need to do our parts in repentance. We need to do our parts in giving our heart to Christ. But it is by grace that we are saved. It is by grace that we attain our righteousness in Him. That's why we have to fully rely on Him and tell Him, Lord Jesus, I need of your nourishment and of your love. I need your word. I need to be present amongst the community of believers, to be connected with one another through the partaking of the one body and the one cup. This is what gives me strength. This is what gives me joy. This is what gives me the ability to go out into the world and witness to you. Lord, I thank you for giving me this great gift of breaking the bread. It is a sign and a signal of a living church, a strong church that has existed from the first century and will continue till your second coming. May the Lord bless us through this amazing and great sacrament and glory be to God forever. Amen.